How are people creating spaces of healing in our communities? How are they using arts? How are they using healing circles? How are they using conversations to transform the lives of young people? And so that was the genesis of the book. And so I traveled the country collecting stories and ethnographic stories, watching people, listening to stories, and how they're using courageous, loving uh, opportunities to create relationships with young people to transform their lives. And so the book really highlights these stories. And they provide us lessons not only about what we do to young people, but what we, do to our, what we need to do for ourselves. We cannot heal young people unless we're healed ourselves. We still, we have things we need to work through, our bias, our shame, right, our insecurities, the ways in which our society structures and offers a racial privilege. We need to work through these things. And so the book provides an in-depth analysis about how is it that people are creating these profound spaces in very difficult situations. But there are challenges to hope. My son, he's a hip-hop head, he introduced me to Kendrick Lamar. I love Kendrick Lamar, right? And Kendrick Lamar in this, this album, Good Kid, Mad City, Kendrick says, look, man, I'm a good kid in a mad city. I'm a good kid. I just have to make crazy decisions based on where I live. I'm a good kid in a mad city, a city that I have to watch my back from the police. I have to navigate the challenges of other gangs. I have to navigate all these issues. But, but when it comes down to it, I'm a good kid. James Farmer or James Gabarino says it in a different way, a researcher. He says that oftentimes young people find themselves in socially toxic environments. Good kids in toxic cities, socially toxic cities. And James, James Gabarino says that just like their physical toxins, like lead paint, asbestos, that if you're exposed to these things, eventually they'll make you sick, right? And if you're not healed from that exposure to toxicity, these physical toxins, they'll actually become lethal. Well, James Gabarino says that just like their physical toxins, they're social toxins. And social toxins are things like fear, anxiety, shame, uncertainty. All of these things are embedded, right? They're, they're, they're worse than physical toxins because you can't see them, you can't smell them, you can't touch them, but they're ever present. They show up in our schools, they show up in our classrooms, and they show up in our after-school programs. And so oftentimes, when a young person in the classroom has his hat on or his hoodie on, the teacher says, take your hoodie off. And the kid turns around and flips the teacher off or says something smart. It's not that the student is being defiant. It's that the student is trying to protect himself from the social toxic environment in which he has to navigate. Right? James Farmer says it a different way. He calls it structural violence. That oftentimes when we think about our communities and our opportunities, that it is more than in the opportunities that we need to seek, but structural violence creates harm to people in these, in, in these communities and neighborhoods. Structural violence suggests that laws and policies, structural racism is not just blocked opportunities. Homophobia is not just blocked opportunities, but they create harm to people in terms of the belief about the possibilities in their lives. James Farmer says that structural violence has two sides of the equation. That we have to think about creating opportunities and widening opportunities for those in our society that are unequal. But we also have to heal from the exposure of not having that opportunity. Right? Both of these things need to happen simultaneously. 